So the work I'm going to present today is ongoing research on feminist perspectives on uh, philosophy of climate science. It's um, a programmatic uh, presentation uh, in which I will uh, emphasize uh, the motivation of uh, using feminist epistemologies uh, to tackle the issue of uh, climate change. And uh, I will start by um, introducing one of the major remaining challenge of climate science today. And then I will give um, the state of the art of philosophy of climate science to give an idea of how this challenge of climate science can be tackled and have been tackled um, by uh, this domain. And um, after that, I will show uh, why feminist insights can be precious uh, to, um, uh, to, to tackle this challenge. So first of all, uh, so I'm, uh, sorry, um, I don't know. I think, <laughs> I think there is a problem with my slides, but that should be okay. Um, first of all, uh, let me um, give some um, uh, important features uh, of uh, climate science, uh, of what is uh, climate science and climate science. So I will not give uh, the whole um, history of climate science and climate services, uh, obviously, but I will try to um, to highlight some of the, the main features of this field. So first of all, um, it's important to say, I think that um, there will not be uh, any climate science without the use of computer simulations. Uh, and this is with the advent of computers and computer simulations that uh, climate science has developed to understand past and present climates and to project uh, future uh, climate impacts. So um, with the computers, cli uh, climate science has been able to produce an expertise on the past and present climate and some anticipation of uh, the future uh, uh, impacts of climate change. One uh, an another important uh, aspect of climate science is that um, the predominant approach in climate science is physics-based. It uh, uh, has been uh, built upon um, the physics, uh, fundamental physics, fluid mechanics, thermodynamics, uh, radiation physics. Uh, this is something that we can see when we um, look at the evolution of uh, general circulation models in the uh, 70s. So here it's a picture, a, a diagram uh, that shows the uh, evolution of the number of models that have been developed uh, in climate science. Uh, so you can see the, the heights of the, the cylinders uh, mirror the, the number of models that have been developed by um, uh, uh, research teams uh, worldwide. And um, you can see that from the 70s uh, to uh, the consecutive versions of the IPCC reports, um, there have been a progressive integration of uh, the physical components of the, the climate system. So many atmosphere, land surface, ocean and sea ice initially, and then later on, uh, models started to integrate aerosols and then biospheres component, including carbon cycle, dynamic vegetation, and later uh, atmospheric chemistry and uh, land ice. Um, so the predominant methodologies uh, as you can already figure out, um, involve um, computer simulations and uh, complex models, including uh, ensembles of uh, general circulation models. So I have added um, this term ensembles because um, 
we don't use one climate model um, in particular we, not one you there is no one unique general circulation model that is improved um but multiple uh, general circulation models and this plurality of models is very important to draw uncertainty ranges uh, um, means uh, probabilities uh, that are then um, given to policymakers. So general circulation models um, represent the climate system at, well, um, large scale um, and the regional climate models represent the climate system at finer geographical scales um, in a way that enable people to have an idea of what is going uh, to happen at um, local scales. Um, and um, another methodology that I think it's it's um, important to note as well is expert elicitation. So the use of expert judgments, and um, it's um, important to use expert judgments um, in the in climate expertise and um, including climate modeling to face uh, uncertainties uh, due to natural variability, but also under the under determination, um, the fact that um, when you have one way to, uh, there, there is no um, no uh, unique way to represent uh, the different parts of uh, the climate system, uh, but um, different ways to do it uh, that are equally good, and also to overcome the, the lack of process understanding. Another feature that is important uh, to highlight is that climate science is a science for policy. It provides uh, policy relevant inputs, including projections uh, of climate change, uncertainty ranges, as I said already, and probabilities. Uh, the general circulation models in particular uh, are very helpful um, to document uh, the projections for the IPCC reports. And uh, they also served the international negotiations of mitigation policies and still serve uh, these negotiations, uh, of course. So climate services is um, a flourishing area uh, in, uh, in uh, um, part of climate science. Um, in which it's a place uh, of co-production of uh, adaptation information for national and local actions. So co-production with scientists and stakeholders and climate services uh, rely on regional climate models. So um, an um, a remaining uh, challenge in climate science is what is called in the literature uh, the usability gap. So the usability gap has been document documented uh, by uh, social scientists uh, and uh, climate scientists and uh, STS, um, science and technology studies as well. Um, the um, Usability gap um, is an epistemic issue. It is, um, first of all, a gap between the general circulation models and uh, regional climate models outputs and the needs of stakeholders. So in, in other words, it's a gap between what climate models provide and what people really need to know for climate change adaptation in particular. Um, and um, it's an issue um, that, um, so this is an epistemic issue in, in the sense uh, that, that covers a, a, a different difficulties. The first difficulty is uh, projecting uh, climate change at local scales. And uh, uh, the difficulty is due to the fact that uh, climate models are all, always uh, approximate representations. 
uh, they are uh, uh, they are uh, idealizations and parametrizations in climate models. These idealizations and parametrizations are necessary um, due to the limitations of uh, computer power and um, and process understanding. Um, so difficulty is to derive and don't scale precise enough information at local scales for um, uh, for, for political actions. Uh, so here, to just to illustrate the, the, the challenge of uh, local scale, I've um, uh, used these uh, screenshots of uh, newspapers this summer uh, that have been, uh, I, I used it because they have circulated uh, on Twitter and um, I think it, it reflects on the, on the um, the, the representative um, topic, uh, topics that have been covered on the issue uh, this summer of uh, floods in Europe um, and, um, and all the catastrophes in the world, um, including in Africa. Um, so this newspaper uh, illustrate uh, the difficulty uh, it has been for um, climate scientists to anticipate uh, European floods and heat intensity, um, and um, I'm not sure whether it is uh, always fair, and uh, whether these newspapers are all fair uh, regarding the work uh, that climate scientists have done uh, to inform um, climate uh, change impacts, but they illustrate uh, this difficulty of projecting at local scales um, to my eyes. Another aspect of this epistemic issue um, is um, the uh, difficulty of addressing, um, especially in, uh, in one kind of models, the human, social, ecosystemic, environmental, economic dimensions. So the multiple dimensions of climate change, uh, the droughts, uh, floods, storms, hurricanes, lead to limited access to food, water, and lands, diseases, deaths, poverty, migration, and um, the difficulty from an epistemic point of view is to be able to, inf to inform about all these uh, issues and concerns that people uh, may have. And uh, it brings us to the second uh, dimension of the usability gap. It's not only an epistemic issue. It's not only an issue related to knowledge production how we uh, gain understanding of uh, local projections um, or how we address the multiple dimensions of climate change is also an issue that is ethical in nature. Uh, first of all, because um, the purposes and priorities within uh, the knowledge production are defined by values. So, here, I should say uh, that what I mean by values is what um, many philosophers uh, call non-epistemic value, characterized as non-epistemic. Um, these values are contextual, they are social, moral, political, or economic in nature and they have many roles uh, in science. They influence research programs, questions, method claims. Uh, they can also influence um, the modeling process, the choices of idealizations, of parametrizations within climate models. Um, they are called non-epistemic uh, usually because they are not supposed to play a role in the production um, of models for models to match the world. Um, but um, it's not clear really uh, whether this dichotomy be between non-epistemic uh, values and epistemic values 
or cognitive values and non-cognitive uh, values hold, as uh, Helen Longino uh, has uh, argued in, uh, in the past. So I prefer to use the term values and to make a distinction uh, between values and aims. Aims being the methodological aims that mod models are supposed to pursue. It can be uh, accuracy, uh, consistency, simplicity, uh, fruitfulness, etc. And values here in the context of climate science can be um, your values as stakeholders uh, related to um, economic growth, whether you value uh, the most uh, envir environmental safety, public health, or biodiversity. And these values will influence the uh, purposes and priorities that you want to be addressed uh, within uh, knowledge production within science. The problem here is that uh, the values that influence knowledge production in climate science are likely to be the values of those who create the knowledge, so the scientific community. And uh, the problem is that the scientific community is a social group that does not mirror the social diversity of the society, uh, the diversity of the stakeholders, of course. Um, and of course, also the role of scientists is not to represent uh, the best interest of the people. Um, and they have not been elected um, for this purpose. Yet, uh, climate-induced inequalities and injustices uh, will be enforced and increased with climate change. We know that um, these uh, inequalities and injustices encompass the existing uh, inequalities, um, class, gender, race inequalities um, at local and national scales. Uh, but also uh, international injustice. Um, so this is a fact that some communities and populations in the world um, are maybe the least responsible for uh, the past uh, greenhouse gas um, emissions and uh, yet uh, will be uh, more affected by climate change and uh, will be probably less prepared uh, to uh, climate impacts. The, uh, um, there is also intergenerational injustice, so the inju injustice to, towards uh, future generations and uh, injustice towards natural world and non-human animals, not to, to forget them. So um, a challenge is to overcome the usability gap is to try to produce uh, usable information. Three criteria uh, I provided by uh, STS. Um, so uh, and the, these criteria uh, include uh, credibility, sciency, and legitimacy. Credible information is uh, information that looks plausible and adequate uh, to the users. Uh, um, salient information are uh, information that are relevant to the needs of the users and stakeholders, but also intellig intelligible uh, to them. Legitimate information is information that looks unbiased, uh, that seems to have been produced following fair processes. Uh, for example, it could be democratically endorsed um, um, uh, processes. And if we... Um, uh, in addition to, to um, um, 
the, to this criteria, we can also try to um, define how to manage values inside science. And first of all, one thing uh, will be um, for scientists to admit they bring personal values to their work. So this is a, a, a paper of uh, Naomi Oreskes uh, in uh, Scientific American in this year, uh, when she talks about this problem that scientists may um, um, bring personal values to the work and uh, somehow shape uh, knowledge uh, production. Another um, uh, recommendation uh, would be to promote diversity in climate science research. And um, there, there has been a, recently a, a paper of uh, Aisha Tandon um, in Carbon Brief, uh, when she shows that uh, there is a lack of diversity in climate science research. Um, she, uh, so there, there is an illustration, uh, this map uh, of, um, that, that, uh, that uh, shows the um, uh, nationality of uh, the authors of the top 100 climate papers. And it's obvious that uh, huge parts uh, of uh, the world uh, are not covered by the community uh, that, um, of the authors that um, have written this uh, 100 climate papers, so important an important part uh, of the uh, of the of the scientific contributions. Another uh, illustration from the same article uh, is this one, when you you can see the unbalance uh, in terms uh, of gender as well. Um, so it, this diversity, diversity should not be only uh, geographical, it should also be uh, gender diversity, of course. Actually, to be completely uh, fair, I think uh, we should recognize that the IPCC try to select um, the, the authors, uh, the contributors of the assessment reports uh, based on very precise selection criteria that are uh, pretty fair. Uh, this uh, selection criteria um, are set as follows, and I quote actually, uh, participation of experts encompassing the range of scientific, technical, and socioeconomic views and expertise, appropriate geographical representation of experts from developing and developed countries, and countries with economies in transition. Balance of men and women, balance between those experienced in working on IPCC reports and those new to the process, including younger scientists. Another aspect we can improve um, at the Interface um, Science Society is um, the inclusion of stakeholders, uh, especially um, in climate services. So there is an increasing rec recognition in social science, um, in philosophy, uh, but also in science and um, in policy more broadly, that um, in order to alleviate climate change induced uh, inequalities and injustices, stakeholders uh, should be invited to express their concerns uh, and their needs. And uh, these concerns and needs should in turn be addressed by scientists into their production of uh, climate information. Um, however, the question of how this can be done uh, while preserving the objectivity of science is, is, is worth um, being addressed. So how philosophy of climate science uh, tackles um, the, 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 the problem of, cl uh, of climate change and, and specifically uh, how can it help to uh, address um, the problem of the usability gap? So let me uh, give a 
a presentation uh, of an, an introduction of uh, philosophy of climate science. Just so this is an emergent subfield of philosophy of science that follows the relatively recent developments uh, in climate science. And I think importantly, it leans on philosophy of scientific models, computer simulations, and decision theory. For this reason, uh, forecasting is pivotal for policy uh, decisions. Um, so uh, it's uh, normal that we focus on climate simulation models and their products that are projections, uncertainty ranges, and probabilities. Even though um, it leans on philosophy of scientific models and computer simulations, it um, has um, its own challenges because climate models uh, raise um, epistemological specificities. First of all, uh, the climate system is a highly complex and uh, even chaotic system. Second, uh, there is a, a use of parameterizations within climate models. So param parameterizations are um, mini models, as Elizabeth Lloyd uh, calls them. There are models that are not always um, theoretically based. Um, there are more approximations uh, of um, subgrid phenomena that are phenomena that are too small to be represented explicitly uh, within uh, the model. And um, there is structural uncertainty that uh, is due to the fact that um, some parts of the climate uh, system um, is has no um, unique representation and there might be some uncertainty on how best to represent all uh, the uh, components of the climate system. Another specificity is the use of um, multiple models to draw projections, uncertainty ranges and probabilities. So they are multiple developments of uh, models in the world. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, another specificity is that it, it, the uses uh, of models for policy making, of course, and uh, that makes uh, uh, um, a huge difference compared to models um, in sciences that are not uh, mandated uh, by the society. So here is uh, another view of um, the main topics that are covered by the philosophy of climate science. Um, theoret theoretical foundations um, with questions like, what is uh, the climate system? How to define uh, climate change, um, climate sensitivity, terms like that. Model evaluation and confirmation. Uh, questions like, can we gain confidence in um, simulation uh, predictions despite uh, idealizations and parameterizations in models? Or under which criteria, uh, under which evaluative criteria can models be confirmed? In particular, there has been um, uh, uh, attention on model robustness uh, what does it really mean uh, when models agree? Quantification and communication of uncertainty, how to characterize uh, the different types of uncertainty, which role can play expert judgments in the quantification? Is the calibrated language of the IPCC appropriate enough to communicate uh, the degrees of uncertainty uh, of uh, key findings? Model paralysis, as I said, it's an important topic uh, in climate science. And then there are questions like how to interpret ensembles of models, 
since uh, they are not uh, coordinated uh, models uh, used to cover um, all uh, possible uh, climates under which conditions can ensemble be used to quantify uncertainty and to yield uh, probabilities. Um, data models in climate science, um, questions like do reanalysis data, so there are specific kind of data used in climate science, count as genuine uh, observational evidence uh, in the far are they are heavily model laden detection and uh, attribution. So uh, there is, uh, there, there are different methods uh, in this respect, model-based probabilities uh, and um, storylines. The question is how best to attribute uh, climate change as a cause to severe weather events or low probability events. Decision-making, uh, what is the appropriate input for policymakers? Uh, how to apply decision theory to climate probabilities? Non-epistemic values. So as I said, I prefer the term uh, values. Uh, how do values, uh, va values influence climate modeling? and uh, manufactured doubts in expertise. So I would say that this is the social epistemology part uh, of it, uh, how to manage disagreements uh, and uh, how doubt has been manufactured uh, in, in the, in the, in the his, in history. So I, um, I had to, to hurry up because I, I'm already short of time, but I um, encourage uh, you to visit um, the annotated bibliography uh, that uh, we have done uh, on this uh, website at the University uh, of Bern uh, with uh, my colleagues, uh, Vincent Lam and Maison Maichak. So now uh, <laughs> the overview of uh, what I, uh, I, I, I propose. Um, philosophy of climate science leans on philosophy of models and simulations. And as suggests, uh, we turn into feminist philosophy of climate science by um, taking uh, and employing some analysis and concept from feminist epistemologies to address uh, issues related to the production of knowledge in climate science, and more particularly, the problem of the usability gap. The question um, usually uh, and mainly addressed in the philosophy of climate science, as I hope uh, the overview of the field, uh, of the main topics in the field um, uh, sh showed, um, are how to produce reliable climate information for policymaking. Are climate models adequate for this purpose? And um, I believe that with feminist epistemologies, we are now able to answer the question how to produce reliable and usable information, which fairly address the needs, the diversity of needs, of stakeholders. So in doing so, by using uh, feminist epistemology to address uh, the uh, epistemi epistemological issues of knowledge production in climate science, we should first be able to uh, point, oh, it's not exactly what I wanted to say, uh, to point out how poor relations shape knowledge production in climate science. But before uh, showing that, what I would like to do is um, to introduce a little bit uh, feminist epistemologies and what kind of insight they actually can provide uh, to, for, for us to, to tackle the usability gap in climate science. So first of all, uh, what feminist epistemologies um, uh, uh, enable us uh, to, to study is the ways power relations shape knowledge production. So not only in climate science, but in science in general. Um, and I would say um, in any context when uh, knowledge is produced. So first of all, um, 
they start with this idea that knowledge is by default situated. A knowledge is produced, produced by and for the knowers. And it's driven by the knowers' worldview. So the, 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 the view of disembodied um, agents um, oh, and that who can distance themselves from the object is over here. Uh, knowers are social agents and we should take into account uh, this, uh, this aspect. Knowledge is located within a specific social, cultural, political context of background assumption, methods, and values. Another, um, uh, another uh, thing is that historical, historically, uh, there have been an underrepresentation of women and marginalized, um, I don't know why I wrote minorities, it's not enough, marginalized groups in science. And this uh, underrepresentation mirror and infinite reinforce poor imbalances within the society. Um, oh, uh, and uh, yes, um, this is an expression that come later in the presentation, but um, the, and the, the, with this um, uh, also apply uh, intersecting system of operation, um, gender, race, class, sexual orientation, ability um, regarding uh, these uh, different dimensions. So, from this um, recognition that knowledge is by default situated, um, this uh, historical observation that, that there has been an underrepresentation of women and marginalized groups, um, that there is um, that there are intersecting systems of oppression um, within um, places where produce where knowledge is produced. Then uh, we come um, with this um, idea, and I would say even claim that historical power relations observed, observed within the society and mirrored within the scientific community in the, in the underrepresentation of certain groups shape knowledge production. And this has been documented. Um, by feminist historians of science, as well as uh, feminist epistemologists, uh, that science has been biased towards uh, prevent uh, uh, and thereby dominant uh, worldviews. Just to give uh, some uh, examples that you, you probably know already, uh, there is this uh, um, uh, work of Emily Martin that showed that uh, there has been biases in uh, reproductive biology due to the way um, um, scientists perceive the role of eggs uh, in the reproduction uh, as being not that active, while it is actually uh, playing um, an active role in reproduction. And uh, this bias slowed down the progress that has been made uh, in this field. There is also the uh, examples of sociobiological models uh, in uh, Haraway, uh, Haraway uh, works uh, when we see that um, the, there is a history of uh, models developed in this field that uh, where uh, again mirroring biases uh, against uh, female and uh, women uh, within the society. Feminist epistemologies or feminist epistemology. Uh, there has been uh, in uh, uh, Harding work in a paper of uh, 1986, uh, this introduction of a tripartite view um, of uh, feminist epistemologies uh, um, being um, 
uh, having three uh, uh, main approaches, feminist empiricism, stain point theory, uh, and feminist postmodernism. Um, I think I'm very late. Uh, I only 14 minutes. Um, but feminist empiricism um, relies on uh, empiricism and this idea that experiment is a firm basis of evidence for knowledge. Um, but it goes um, further than uh, um, traditional empiricism. But by suggesting ways, um, critical reflexivity within the scientific community can help to correct for dominant biases. Steinpunt theory um, stipulates uh, that we should think from marginalized standpoints in uh, the scientific inquiry. Uh, those standpoints are fed by unique uh, lived experiences and they give privileged access to invaluable evidence for the scientific inquiry. And feminist postmodernism um, has this idea of this possibility to shift perspective from different uh, perspectives through uh, what is called transcendence of uh, situatedness. But um, despite these uh, this, um, uh, different approaches, what uh, feminist epistemologies uh, have observed is that there has been a convergence of ideas and uh, theses uh, within feminist epistemologies over time. To the point uh, that uh, Interman has even elaborated a unique feminist standpoint in empiricism. And I just would like to uh, um, point out the very new uh, Rutledge uh, Handbook of Feminist Philosophy of Science that appeared this year and uh, that has been edited by uh, Krasnow and Interman. Okay. Uh, so here would be a proper definition of feminist philosophy of science, I think, and it comes from uh, this uh, Rutledge handbook in the introduction. Feminist philosophy of science involves the study of how intersecting system of operation, so here comes, from, from, uh, comes the uh, expression, influence the production of scientific knowledge and the development of normative recommendations for how scientific practices and methodologies might better serve our epistemic aims, while also producing the kind of knowledge and practices that might aid in achieving social injustice. And I will say that the third point, um, um, producing knowledge that supports social justice is just not just an additional requirement that adapts, but uh, it's a transversal uh, worry and uh, consideration um, in, in the work uh, of feminist epistemologies. And this is precisely why the feminist philosophy of, of science approach is relevant to tackle the problem of usability gap because um, it shows how uh, uh, poor relations shape knowledge and uh, production, and it gives recommendations on how to produce a knowledge that is usable for everyone and that promotes social justice, exactly what we should uh, fight for uh, regarding um, the, the, the issues of um, inequalities and injustices induced by climate change. So I'd like now to focus on the normative recommendations of feminist uh, epistemologies. So first of all, I would say that there is a philosophy of science dimension of feminist uh, philosophy of science and, a, so and a, a social epistemology dimension. Very often, feminist epistemologies are um, described as social epistemologies. But um, I think it's fair to say that there, one part is a philosophy of science and one other part is a, is a social epistemology. 
that mean that uh, the feminist epistemology provide um, recommendations regarding the uh, construction of scientific representations, including theories and models. Um, they have, there have been discussions on uh, which methodological aims scientific representation should pursue. Uh, um, and um, the, the, regarding the scientificity of these aims and the influence of values in the definition of these aims. There is, has been also um, discussions on how to distinguish between legitimate values that can be used as um, a precious uh, cognitive uh, sources uh, from which uh, we can start our scientific inquiry and um, uh, detrimental biases. <clears throat> and this is uh, this uh, leads to uh, discussions uh, about the bias, uh, what is called the bias paradox that maybe may empiricist uh, feminist uh, is too permissive uh, in the biases that are tolerated uh, in knowledge production, uh, but also a discussion regarding the um, uh, meaning of the epistemic advantage uh, given to uh, or privilege given to uh, marginalized standpoints by the standpoint theory. And there is a social epistemology uh, side of uh, feminist epistemologies, um, a dimension that deals with inter individual relations, social organization, and group structure. So within uh, feminist epistemologies, um, value management accounts have been given. They are social accounts of objectivity against uh, the value-free ideal. They include the procedural objectivity, um, um, well known as a, a um, critical contextual empiricism of uh, Helen Longino, and uh, the concept of strong objectivity uh, developed by uh, Sandra Harding. Um, I won't give more details because I feel that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm late. Uh, but I think uh, I should emphasize that, that uh, feminist epistemologists give um, recommendation on how scientists uh, as a community should operate uh, for uh, representation, to create representation that can uh, pursue the aims uh, that have been defined uh, beforehand. Um, and they insist on scientists uh, um, being transparent uh, regarding the position, the social location, that's uh, what I've called the posi positionality. Uh, they promote critical reflexivity and uh, social diversity for cognitive diversity. So in order um, to um, take into account uh, diversity of uh, perspectives within science, it's important or to have uh, some social diversity uh, within science or within uh, knowledge production. And this diversity can be diversity of social locations as, uh, um, as um, promoted by uh, Longino or um, diversity of standpoints. So this is discussions that have been um, in, in the literature, um, uh, Rowling in particular, uh, uh, speak about it. Okay, so now feminist perspective on the usability gap. What feminist perspectives um, um, on the usability gap are? First of all, um, feminist epistemology says something about how poor relations uh, shape knowledge production. So they uh, will uh, enable us to highlight uh, where the differences stand. So the different choices may differ from one group to another regarding the objects of interest, targeted data and outputs, depending on the priorities and value 
and values of the people. Uh, they may uh, differ also regarding theoretical hypotheses and background assumptions, but also methodological aims and values. And I think that um, feminists' insights um, uh, enable us to see that the challenges um, it's not only a problem of reliability of information at local scales, as mainstream philosophy of science would take off. It's not just a, um, a problem of access to information or a lack of information. It will, be, it will not be sufficient to just give more data to the people because they need more data. It's not just a quantity of data. It's how data has been produced. So the problem, it's also a problem of consistency of relevant and intelligible information with the value systems of the people who will use this uh, information. And um, the feminist inside will, um, will give ideas on how to change the social practices in order to have uh, knowledge of support social justice. First of all, in climate services, as I said, there is a co-production of climate information between scientists and uh, stakeholders. And one aspect that feminist uh, epistemologists uh, will highlight is the representativeness uh, in the consulted groups of stakeholders. So it can be um, guaranteed by uh, representatives uh, mediating groups interest, but it can also be deliberative groups of citizens um, and uh, the importance of including local and indigenous communities. And uh, they will highlight um, that it's important to provide conditions for the uptake of the stakeholders' values um, to be done properly. Uh, they discuss the material conditions of that, uh, including open forums, and which look like the stakeholder di dialogue that we have with climate services, opinion polls, etc. Another aspect that is uh, uh, discussed also in the literature is, of course, the role of trusts and the promotion of epistemic justice for respectful exchanges and fruitful deliberations. Okay, so I will conclude with, um, with this slide, which is actually the outline of my uh, on, ongoing research project toward the feminist philosophy of science. And uh, it's exactly, I'm exactly on time, so I'm happy. <laughs> and um, and the, the, this, this uh, research project uh, has four parts. Uh, the first one is about the role of values and the way we can implement objectivity in climate services based on the social accounts of objectivity uh, of uh, feminist epistemologies. Uh, the second uh, part is uh, about the um, plurality of climate modeling perspectives to address the diversity of concerns being social, economic, uh, ecosystemic, um, uh, uh, concerns of the stakeholders. The third part is about the inter integration of local and indigenous knowledge uh, within climate science. But uh, I, I, I should be careful here because it's something I'm, I'm making progress on this uh, aspect. And actually, I should emphasize, emphasize the fact that I will mainly study the usability of local and, indig and indigenous knowledge for local and indig indigenous communities, um, especially. And the, four, uh, the fourth part uh, is about uh, the connections between epistemic, epistemic injustice, uh, as um, uh, introduced by Miranda Fricker, and climate injustice. Thank you. 
So here is just a reference of a paper that I found super interesting on, uh, on these ideas that philosophy, uh, that feminist epistemology can help uh, um, tackling uh, issues related to climate change. And three papers of mine that are um, um, in the spirit of using feminist epistemologies of uh, drawing feminist epistemology into the philosophy of climate science. Thanks.